Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge, shooting today at Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan. I'm Peter Robinson. Uh, and since we're at, at a college today, it's especially appropriate to note that you can follow Uncommon Knowledge on Facebook. Uh, Facebook.uncknowledge.com. Facebook forward slash unknowledge.com. Paul Ray, my guest today, holds the Charles O. Lee and Louise K. Lee Chair in the Western Heritage at Hillsdale College. He's the author of many books, including the topic of uh, much of our conversation today, his magisterial 1992 work, Republics, Ancient and Modern. Paul, welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. It's a pleasure to be back. And I hope to give you half an hour or so to prove that for a grown man to write a book of this heft is not as odd an enterprise as it might at first appear. <laughs> Segment one, Republics Ancient. To quote from your book, Paul, from Republics Ancient and Modern, for the comparative study of republicanism, historical inquiry is our recourse. In no other way can we liberate ourselves from the tyranny of the familiar. Explain. Well, we live in a circumscribed world. We think of it as uncircumscribed because it's a global world. But that very fact means we are radically separated from the past. Uh, and even within, say, 150 years from a past, in which people lived in radically local circumstances. I have a friend who died a couple years ago. And in the 1930s, he was a fellow of the Institute of Current World Affairs. I was one of these fellows in Istanbul. He was in Kashmir in the 1930s in a little village living with a uh, school teacher. Uh, and he went back to that village 50 years later mm -hmm. and spent a few weeks living with the grandson of the school teacher, who is now the school teacher in that village. When he first lived in that village in Kashmir, the people in the village had never heard of England. England ruled India. England ruled Kashmir. But they'd never heard of England. When he went back, the people in that village were discussing Tiananmen Square mm -hmm. because they listened to the BBC every day. Mm -hmm. um, that village, when he was there in the 1930s, was in the ancient world. That village, when he returned, was as connected to the modern world as we are here in the United States. Um, we don't understand ancient conditions. We don't understand how they lived, how they thought, and how they looked at things. And uh, I wandered into writing this book because I was working on ancient Sparta. I'm trained as an ancient historian. I, I did a PhD at Yale with Donald Kagan. I studied ancient history at Oxford on a Rhodes Scholarship. I thought, I understand the American Constitution because I've lived under it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't really understand ancient Sparta, but perhaps I can understand ancient Sparta by writing a short little article in which I compare the Spartan Constitution and the way it worked with the American Constitution. So I'm sort of using American questions to investigate mm -hmm. Sparta. What I discovered is I knew Sparta a whole lot better than I understood the American Constitution. So the little short article that I thought I was going to write turned into a 1,200-page book um, in, in the process of sort of thinking through these questions. Meaning, when I tried to look at us through the eyes of the ancient Spartans, I began seeing things that when I looked at us through our own eyes, I did not see. Paul, you, you write, above all else, we lack a sense of our own peculiarity. Right. Explain that. Well, up until 1920, even in the United States, the majority of people lived on farms. Mm -hmm. uh, it was the land that was important. Uh, since 1920, to an ever-increasing degree, nobody lives on farms. I think it's down to 2 or 3% now. We are cut off from the vision of the world, of the farmer. Uh, we are peculiar in all of human history in that particular. We are also peculiar in living in a world in which reason, logos in ancient Greek, mm -hmm. is applied to, to art, to techne. 
we are living in a technological world. We are living in a world which is transformed every 10 or 15 years. When I went to college, I took a typewriter. I have four small children. They have never seen a typewriter. Right, right. They don't know what a typewriter is. Yes. Um, there was no Xerox machine. When I first started teaching college, we had mimeograph machines. Right. Um, right. Think of the difference that radio made. Think of the difference that the printing press made before that. Think of the difference television makes now. Think of the difference the internet has made in the last few world, years. We live in a world that is being upended all the time. Mm -hmm. um, they lived in a world of radical stability. All no right. technological progress, no transformation. Commerce is not primary. You grow food for yourself and do a little bit of trading on the margins with other people. Right. You, it's just the other day my nine-year-old said, Dad, when you were my age, did you use a Mac or a PC? <laughs> you know the feeling. But listen, but Paul, Republic's Ancient and Modern suggests in its very title that there is some continuity. Yes. So what is, first of all, first things first, before we leave this opening segment, what is a republic? Oh, that's a complicated business. Uh, it's the Latin word res publica, which means pu public thing. Mm -hmm. as opposed to the Latin phrase res privata, which means private thing. The private thing is the household, from which we exclude people except for a very small group. The public thing is literally out in the air, where you hold public assemblies. Mm -hmm. um, a res publica is a form of government where there is a public space, that public space is constituted by speech. Our bodies are separate, but we share a conversation. When we say we share a meal, we don't really share a meal. We share a conversation that goes on during a meal. Right. What, puts a, what creates a political community and brings it together is discourse. That is to say, public deliberation concerning what Aristotle called the advantageous, the just, and the good. In an absolute monarchy, there is no public conversation. The res publica is absorbed into the res privata, and it is within the household that everything is governed. The Emperor Augustus governed Rome through his freedmen from within his household. Uh, he governed it the way you would govern a familia in ancient Rome. Uh, and the res publica disappeared into the res privata. So, what a republic is about is self-government of a group of people who are counted as citizens and are therefore members of the ruling order. That self-government takes place through argument, discussion, and thinking. Uh, primarily deliberation, though negotiation plays a role in it. So even in the, the modern circumstances, which you just, just delineated, radio, television, internet, cut off from the common experience of mankind through the millennia of farming, the United States of America today remains, properly speaking, does remain a republic. Yes. All right. Uh, to the founders of this republic, segment two. You quote, in Republics Ancient and Modern, you quote historian Gilbert Chinar, quote, we can hardly realize the power exerted by the classics at a time and in a land where only a few books were available, close quote. Briefly, give us some feeling for the intellectual context in which Adams and Jefferson and Madison were operating. They're all brought up uh, learning Latin and, and the very best of them, Adams and Jefferson, learning Greek. So if you read their correspondence with one another, they will be discussing things and quoting the Greek back Those and forth to one another. Terrible show offs that they were. Um, People who are not as well educated have Plutarch in John Dryden's translation. So, uh, you know, what book would they have? They would have the Bible mm -hmm. in the King James Version. They would often have Plutarch and they would have Shakespeare. And oftentimes they learn their Roman history from reading Shakespeare's Roman plays. Mm -hmm. And if you look at carefully at Shakespeare's Roman plays, I occasionally teach them, they're right out of Plutarch. Uh, he makes some adjustments, 
but he makes not very many changes. Uh, so the movement in the direction of republicanism in, in the 18th century and earlier in 17th century Britain takes place in the shadow of the ancient texts of Thucydides, of Livy, of Tacitus, and I think above all else of Plutarch. Um, there is a memory of a time when people governed themselves and they govern themselves through public assemblies and through public debate. Right. Two quotations, both drawn again from mm -hmm. Republic's Ancient and Modern. You quote Clinton Rossiter, quote, the Americans would have believed just as vigorously in public morality had Cato and the Gracchi never lived. Hannah Arendt, without the classical uh -huh. example shining through the centuries, none of the men of the revolution would have possessed the courage for what then turned out to be unprecedented action. Clinton Rossiter, yes, they had these books in their library. Yes, it may have informed the vocabulary they used in talking about the circumstances they encountered, but they'd have come to the same result. Hannah Arendt, those books in the library were central to the endeavor. Hannah Arendt is right and Clinton Rossiter is wrong. Keep in mind, the Americans of that generation, especially the leading men, they begin with a quarrel, a legal quarrel with Britain over the question of taxation. Uh, they are driven against their wills, really, to begin to think about independence. When they think about independence, they rethink government and they eliminate the king. How is it that they get to eliminating the king? The answer is they have been brought up on the classics of Greek of, of Greece and Rome, and it has fired their imaginations. And so a man like John Adams finds himself in a situation in which he says, my gosh, we're going to be able to do what Romulus did, what Lycurgus did, what Solon did. In other words, they think of themselves as lawgivers, as legislators, as framers of constitutions, first at the state level and then at the national level. And they begin to think about themselves on that classical model. Now, Hannah Arendt talks about the courage. Well, the answer is, this was done before. We can do it again. So, so what's your important lesson for students at Hillsdale and students everywhere, I think, if I get it right, as they looked at lived political reality in their time, looking back to Europe, monarchies, principalities, this model was everywhere. Yes. To them, the models in the books, the ancient histories they read, they were such good students and had such imaginative powers that what they saw in the book was as real an option as the options presented to them by the reality of their day. Absolutely. And you, by the way, you can see the same thing in France in the years leading up to the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. The American Revolution fires the imagination of Frenchmen because they see something happening on the other side of the Atlantic. They have read these same books and suddenly Cato becomes real to them. And you begin to get David doing these, these, these sort of classical scenes in the decades before the revolution. So they're beginning to think along those lines. Mm. Uh, another way of putting it is the modern nation state is an attempt to recapture what the ancient Greeks and Romans had. Now, Paul, you write, again, once again from Republics Ancient and Modern, you aim, you write, to, to quote, set the modern republic alongside the Greek republic so that the elements of continuity and discontinuity in the history of republicanism can become visible. We're recording a webcast. Our time, this is like trying to reduce an ox to a bullion cube, but as briefly as you can, what did the American founders accept and what did they reject from the ancient Greek example? Okay, the American founders not only are drawing on classical literature, they're also drawing on um, a large body from Machiavelli to Montesquieu of modern, early modern European literature all of which is written as a kind of reflection upon 
the ancient experience. Mm -hmm. That literature is both inspired by liberty in ancient Greece and liberty in ancient Rome, by Herodotus, Thucydides, and Livy, and Cicero, and so forth. And it is critical of the failure of the ancient Greek cities and of ancient Rome. So the Americans inherit both the ancient example as an inspiration and the criticism of the ancient example. Um, and of course, the ancient Greek republics blew up. They failed. Philip of Macedon, Alexander the Great conquered them. Rome grows. It conquers the Eastern Mediterranean and the Western Mediterranean, and then the Romans lose their liberty. So there is a meditation that goes on from the 16th century through the 18th century, through the middle of the 18th century, that the Americans have inherited. They have read Machiavelli. They have read David Hume. They have read Montesquieu. Uh, and they have thought critically about the failure of the ancient republics. So what the Americans are trying to do is to succeed where the ancient republics failed. Paul, why wouldn't a disinterested observer look at this experiment and say, the arrogance is breathtaking. They are saying, here is a monarchy which has been in existence for six centuries in Britain. If you compare Britain to Europe, they have greater wealth and greater liberties than anywhere else in Europe, anywhere else in the known world at the time, with the exception of the colonies here. But still, the British example isn't all that bad for all the Lord North's ministry. They're saying, Rome, oh yes, it may have lasted a thousand years, but we can do better than that. And then they go back to ancient Greece. They go back to Pericles and say, tut, tut, it had its faults, which we can correct. I mean, isn't there something a little bit overweening yes. about the whole project? How, how do you handle that? Well, look, if, if, if you had talked to any one of the people who are going to be important in the year 1762 or 1763, right. and you had told them what they were going to do, they would have looked at you as if you were insane. They were all loyal monarchists. They were all admirers of the British Constitution. Um, they come to be frustrated with the British Constitution because of the way they're being treated. And of course, there are political disputes in Britain going on at the same time in which there are radical Whigs critical of the workings of the British Constitution, in particular of the use of patronage. Uh, and of corruption, right? Uh, they inherit that discourse too and begin to take it more and more seriously as they become frustrated with the way Britain is treating them. And at a certain point they realize they're going to have to go it alone. And it's then that ambition kicks in. And you're absolutely right, the ambition is breathtaking. Um, it is not mad, however. Uh, underpinning it is the fact that the, um, the, the, the population of North America is doubling every 10 years. Benjamin Franklin has written an essay on this. And Franklin is a man who, from very early on, imagined a British empire that was ruled from here and not from the other side. He saw that the colonies were gaining in weight and that the time would come, and he could project right into the future mm -hmm. demographically, mm -hmm that the colonies would actually be a bigger source of wealth than England itself. Mm -hmm. So, Paul, republics ancient and modern, we have here 25 centuries. Take the moment, 1787, the Constitution is presented for ratification. That republic, as it is about to come into the world, ranks where, in your estimation, in the long history of republics? How good a job did they do? It is the greatest of the republics. Stop there. Now we proceed to segment three, what has happened since. Again, from republics ancient and modern. In the last six decades, we have witnessed a consolidation of government and a centralization of administration, which would have left even an Alexander Hamilton nonplussed the federal courts have transformed the Constitution and the Bill of Rights into an instrument subversive of private institutions. The greatest of the Constitutions subverted in our lifetime. What's gone wrong? Progressivism 
I could give you a single word for it. In the late 19th century, under the influence of Hegel, large numbers of Americans went abroad and did PhDs in German institutions and came back and transformed American institutions. We should have cut everybody off of the 13th century. Uh, well, at, at the 18th century. All right, okay. Um, the, the, uh, the idea comes that good government is the work of a civil service, of a universal class that embodies wisdom, something like Plato's guardians. Mm -hmm. uh, and that democracy is only there to um, sanction, to put the, the stamp of consent on the wisdom of these rational administrators. The vision is propagated in the late 19th century. It is taken up uh, and um, brought to the national scene by Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. Uh, in the shadows in the Wilson administration is the young Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Wilson, in a way, fails politically, and Roosevelt figures out a way to succeed politically by bringing patronage politics together with rational administration. Uh, and there's a tension there because patronage mm -hmm. politics means corruption mm -hmm. and rational administration is at odd with the spirit. Uh, and we're, we're seeing this. Solyndra is a very good example of this right now um, in, in which you know, there's this supposedly green energy, but it turns out we're putting money into just the right pockets. Right. Um, right. The, 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 so you get a growth of the administrative state and it grows by always offering people a helping hand. With that helping hand goes control. Uh, one can see it best at colleges and universities. Uh, there, there is a law uh, now that, uh, that actually specifies, essentially, that you cannot change your book list for a course you're teaching uh, between the time you announce that you're teaching the course and the time the course is offered can't change your mind. As a matter of federal regulation. It's a federal law. And Stanford University can lose uh, all of its federal money uh, if they do not comply with this sort of micromanagement. Uh, because some student complained that a professor had changed one or two of the books in the course at the last minute, and this student had gone to Amazon and had bought the books and couldn't return them. And so some congressman wrote it into the law. Mm -hmm. And since Stanford lives off of the federal government, with this helping hand comes control, as every adolescent knows. Um, so it, there has been a subversion. Look, the two principles that underlie the American Constitution are federalism and the separation of powers. Federalism means that the federal government at the center does a few important things that the states can't do for themselves. Everything else is done at the state and local level, closer to people, more under their control. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The separation of powers means nothing happens unless Congress votes it, and it's debated in both the House and the Senate. The administrative state means almost everything is decided in administrative agencies in the form of regulations that have that have the force of law, that aren't debated in Congress. We can't vote out these administrators who have passed these regulations. And so what you've got is a, a, a supposedly rational administration shielded from popular control. You have the forms of republicanism. We have elections, but the elections don't matter anymore mm. because the decisions are made by the EPA or OSHA or one of the 150 agencies set, under, up, set up under Obamacare. Paul, let me put it to you that something like this was bound to happen sooner or later because the founders made a mistake. Republic, ancient and modern, I quote you to yourself, the history of the, uh, excuse me, ours is and almost always has been a remarkably undemanding polity which provides little in the way of clear, direct moral guidance and Americans have therefore generally been satisfied to live and let live and go their own way." Close quote. So, <clears throat> in Isaiah Berlin's famous essay, Two Concepts of Liberty, there's the sense of negative liberty, which is that the government is only there to make sure you are left alone. 
positive liberty, the government is there to do things to you, to take you someplace, or to put it in a more benign way. We know from her diaries, a contrast coming here, of nearly contemporary figures, we know from her diaries that Queen Victoria, as a consecrated monarch, really believed that in some way it was her duty to lead her people to heaven, mm -hmm. to lead her people to God. And by contrast with Calvin Coolidge, who believed that it was his duty as President of the United States to enforce the laws and that it was the job of the laws merely to permit people to enjoy their own property in peace, to defend the Republic, and to stay out of anybody else's business. And Coolidge wrote not long after stepping down as President that he considered it his highest achievement that as Chief Executive of the United States of America, he, Calvin Coolidge, had minded his own business. So you get this contrast between the old European no notion that the government is, is to command a joint enterprise, that a nation is to go someplace, versus the American position, the government is just to let you sort all that out on your own. And maybe that's too much to ask of ordinary populaces. Maybe we need this therapeutic, Oprah Winfrey-like government which says, if you have a problem, I'll have you on my talk show. I'll hold your hand. I'll come up with some sort of program to ease your pain in life. Do you see what I'm getting at? Yes. So what do you make of that, Paul? Well, I, the, the, the argument you're making is the argument I made in a later book, Soft Despotism, Democracy's Drift, uh, that this particular form of government leaves human beings anxious. And commercial societies leave human beings anxious. You can't make a living making typewriters anymore. Uh, and who knows what, what, what ways of making a living are going to be driven out of existence by new technology that moves things along. I mean, it, it's constant. Students who come to college have to expect to be flexible and to move from one profession or one, one way of earning a living to another because because of creative destruction, Schumpeter's uh, fam famous line. Uh, but also, these are societies in which when you leave people to their own devices, it's scary. Uh, so what we need to do is recapture the scariness? No. Before 1912, before Woodrow Wilson, before the beginning of the progressive era, which I believe is coming to an end in 2012, but that's another we'll come, issue. We will come to that, yeah. I assure um, you. We'll come to that, Before the beginning of that, there's something in between a federal government that minds its own business and ordinary people. Uh, and one aspect of what's in between is local self-government. Many of the things that we now think of as being done nationally were done locally. Think of all the hospitals in this mm. country. Very few of them have been built with federal money. They were built with local money. Uh, sometimes by local governments, fairly often by associations. When Tocqueville came to the United States, the thing that struck him uh, was not so much the federal constitution or the state constitutions, but local government and then the spirit of association, the capacity of Americans who, when they found themselves in trouble, would band together with their neighbors Privately, to get things done. Yes. yes. Uh, the, 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 the way people overcame this anxiety that goes naturally with commercial societies and with, with governments that mind their own business, the way they overcame that is through cooperative efforts with their families, with their neighbors, uh, and, and, and through local government. The other, the other way that they were shielded in some measure from anxiety was strong families. Mm. Um, when divorce is so exceptional as to be almost unthinkable, there are people you can depend upon, right. your family, right. and they're always there. And when Tocqueville came to America, he was just stunned by the strength of the families. Paul, segment four, polls apart. We've not talked about this. I don't think we've even exchanged emails on this on Ricochet, but there's several aspects of contemporary American political life that strike me as important, maybe alarming, and while I've got you, I want to ah. see what Paul Ray has to say about them. Partisan polarization. Just a few decades ago, the Republican Party had its left wing and its right wings. The 
liberals in the Eastern establishment, the conservatives out West. The Democratic Party was even more pronounced, the liberals in the Northeast and the very conservative Democrats in the South. You think of the Southern uh, barons of the Senate, John Cornelius Senate, Stennis of Mississippi, or uh, John Sparkman of Alabama. So that both our parties contained left and right wings. Mm -hmm. And of course, in recent decades, that has sort the parties have sorted themselves out on ideological lines. Yes. So that in 1954, the Republicans pick up 54 seats, and they do so largely by taking 30-some seats that had been held by conservative Democrats in the South and making them Republican seats. Mm -hmm. So, Democrats over there, Republicans over there, and the area of interlap, which used to be considerable, is now thin and attenuated and disappearing. Trouble? Yes, of course. It's happened many times in American history, though. Uh, it happens in 1800, mm. a very bitter election. Uh, it happens in uh, 1832, a very bitter election. It happens in 1860. Uh, it happens in uh, 1932. Um, there are sort of two periods in American political life. Uh, there are periods in which one party or another has hegemony, uh, and there is a measure of consensus uh, the parties fight over who can best manage the American government in this set of circumstances. Right. And then there are other periods when we make decisions about the direction of American life. We are approaching, we have been approaching for some time, a period when a decision is going to be made. Mm. Uh, I think the 2012 election uh, may be the most important election in your lifetime or mine, even more important than the 1980 election, which is the precursor to the 2012 election. Okay, we'll, I'm still holding you off on 2012. I want to try another yes. couple of these on you. Polarization with regard to the constitutional order. On the Supreme Court, till just, just, just a few years ago, Republic, Republican appointees were some of the most liberal members of the Supreme Court. That has stopped, with yes. the single exception of Mr. Justice Kennedy, who goes either way. But broadly speaking, the Democratic appointees are now liberal, and the Republican appointees are now conservative. And moreover, among liberals generally, over the last few years, you get increasing discomfort with the Constitution. Rick Hertzberg, writing in the New Yorker magazine this past January, the biggest obstacle to energetic, coherent action is systemic. Our ungainly 18th century legislative mechanism is shot through with veto points. We have three separately elected governments, House, Senate, and Presidency, all of which must agree for anything big to happen. Our two-year election cycle leaves little time for long-acting changes to be ripened, to ripen and be judged fairly, and we're stuck with it. Paul? That sounds like Woodrow Wilson in 1912, who makes exactly the same attack on the Constitution. Teddy Roosevelt, the nominee of the Progressive Party, in 1912 is making exactly uh, the, the, the same set of claims. Uh, they're frustrated by limited government. They want unlimited government. There's so much they want to do. That's right, and they want to do it to us. Right. Beverly Perdue down in North Carolina would like to do without elections. Yes. Uh, and it, you know, so that we can get something done and then get the American people lined up and make them consent to it. Right. right. Last point of polarization, potentially to me the most serious, but we'll see what you say about it, Paul. From the new book, American Grace, by the political scientists Robert Putnam and David Campbell, quote, longish quotation, but important, I think. Um, you may tell me that it's, I'm wrong, feel free, but I think it's important. Americans are increasingly concentrated at opposite ends of the religious spectrum. The highly religious at one pole and the avowedly secular at the other. In the past, there were religious tensions, but they were largely between religions, Catholic versus Protestant, most notably, rather than between the religious and the irreligious. Today there is a growing secular swath of the population." Close quote. So we find ourselves dividing into the party of God and the party of irreligion. This is a problem? Yes, but it is a sign that we're coming to a great decision All about right. the future of American life. 
All right, on now then to the present hour, segment five, and the great decision. We've spoken about 25 centuries of history. In the history of republics, ancient and modern, how important is the election of 2012? Wow. Um, very important. The question is, is there going to be political liberty 100 years from now? Or is there going to be an administrative order? Think of the European Union and the giving up of sovereignty. And when sovereignty is ceded, it's ceded to Brussels. And what you have in Brussels are administrators. The presumption is the peoples of the various European countries really cannot govern themselves properly, and they must hand everything over to these all-wise administrators, which is what has been happening. It's perfectly Hegelian. Mm -hmm. uh, the same question exists in this country. Are we going to be governed by putatively rational, administrators at the center who can decide the shape of our toilets, what kind of light bulbs we have, when we can order books for our classes, uh, minute things in our lives. Can they decide them better than we do? Is it their wisdom that should govern us? Or will that inevitably lead to tyranny in which we are governed by their whimsy? Uh, by their anger and their hostility. Uh, we, have a, we have a court case now in which the administration uh, argues that a religious group like the Lutheran Church can't discriminate against heretics by removing a minister from a Lutheran Church, right. which is to say uh, religious freedom disappears. There, there's a reason why everyone uh, why those who believe in God and go to church are concentrated on one end of the political spectrum, they're threatened. And they're threatened by the notion that rational administration will bring us heaven on earth. Look, progressivism um, is not just a political doctrine, it's a religious doctrine. In the same way that communism was not just a political doctrine, it was a religious doctrine. Paul, let me give you two quotations. The first is Paul Ray. This is a couple of years ago, the, your last appearance on this program. Quote, by the way, I almost fell off my chair when I heard this. Quote, the election of Barack Obama was a gift to the friends of liberty. That's you. Now here's Wall Street Journal columnist Holman Jenkins. Jenkins wrote a column a couple of weeks ago about Europe saying that they may make progress here or there, but they're going to be staggering from crisis to crisis. Quote, sadly, a similar destiny probably lies ahead for the United States. Only after a series of panics, possibly quite destructive ones, will politicians have leeway to seriously address the unsustainability of the current welfare state. Every move will be too little to ward off another crisis, another showdown, potentially decades of political strife and economic uncertainty await us." Close quote. You want to stick with your original quotation, or are you feeling more Holman Jenkins-y these days? Well, I've always been with Holman Jenkins. Oh, you have? Yes. That is to say, I've always thought that the crisis would come when it became visible that the entitlement state and the administrative state is unsustainable. My view is Barack Obama brought that date forward, especially with Obamacare, which piles more expense on. The notion that it would reduce costs is insane. Uh, nobody believed it at right. the time. Uh, and by behaving in the manner in which he behaved, by shoving things through Congress unread, in other words, you have a situation, there's no public debate on any of these bills. No one got to read them before they voted on them. Speaker How could they Pelosi, possibly Speaker Pelosi debate? said, we'll have to enact this to find out right. what's in it. What he did is he exposed, he pulled off the covers of the tyrannical inclinations 
that lie at the heart of the administrative state. And people saw it. They saw it before their political leaders saw it. The Tea Party is making its move and the Republicans are still thinking about cooperating with Barack Obama. Right. So Barack Obama made us aware as a people of the disaster approaching it, which gives us an opportunity to articulate the argument against the administrative entitlement state and to hold an election over that issue. Okay, Barack Obama has teed up this election, this election which even against the backdrop of 25 centuries stands out as critical. And what do we have? Mitch Daniels is out. Jeb Bush is out. Haley Barber is out. Chris Christie's people, according to this morning's news, it sounds as though they're leaking to prepare people that he too will remain out of the race. Mm -hmm. I talked with Michael Barone, our friend Michael Barone, political columnist a couple of weeks ago, and said, Michael, how would you rate the current Republican field? And he said, not one of the people I would consider the 10 most accomplished and talented on the Republican side in this country is a member of that field. Michael Barone, let me quote to you Michael Barone, a column that Michael wrote a couple of months ago. I, he, he's interviewing Paul Ryan. I asked Ryan, Paul Ryan, congressman from Wisconsin 1st Congressional District and chairman of the House Budget Committee. I asked Ryan if he had read Paul Ray's ricochet post entitled, yes. Paul Ryan, A Duty to Serve. We now face a great crisis, Ray wrote, and you, Paul Ryan, understand what has to be done better than anyone else. You have a duty to serve. I, Michael Barone, handed Ryan a copy of Ray's post and urged him to read it. He said that he would. As I say, that was Michael Barone last June. Now, here's yours truly, Peter Robinson, talking to Paul Ryan just last week. I got an email from Paul Ray, Professor Paul Ray yeah, of Hillsdale. Ricochet, yeah, sure. You know Paul. And here's what Paul wanted me to read to you. Quote, what an opportunity we have been given, and what will it mean if we waste it? Congressman? <laughs> no pressure. Yeah. That's, that, that clip basically is what I think, how I feel. Um, you know, it's not as if one person is, is we can do this. And uh, I don't feel like I have to be the vessel uh, on top of the ticket in 2012 to do this. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, from the House, we've done a lot to frame this debate. We've done a lot to move this conversation to where it belongs, and we can do more to do that. Um, but just like I said there, uh, you have to have it in your mind, in your heart, in your gut to so badly want to be president to run effectively for it, and I just don't have that. Paul? In Plato's Republic, an argument is made that the people who are the best rulers are the ones who don't want to rule. When I look at the declared candidates, I hold my head in my hands. Um, they want it too much. There doesn't seem to be anyone in the group that can articulate the argument. Uh, that's where Holman Jenkins comes in. Mm -hmm. There's a very good chance, and I've thought this from the beginning and in articles on Powerline and BigGovernment.com and Ricochet, I keep coming back to it. The only thing that can save the administrative entitlement state is the fecklessness of the Republican Party. Well, I'm sure we'll do our best. And uh, <laughs> now, that having been said, what Paul Ryan just said about what he and his colleagues have been doing in Congress is true and amazing to me. Mm -hmm. Because leadership usually comes from presidential nominees, presidential candidates, governors, people in executive positions or aspiring to executive positions. This is a remarkable moment where the chairman of the House Budget Committee is actually the leader of the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. The reason that I argued he had a duty to run is he's the only one out there I think Governor Daniels would have been very good, but Governor Daniels had decided not to run. He was the only one out there who was articulating the argument. Last night at Hillsdale College, you gave a talk on the rhetoric of Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. and you showed a series of clips from his speeches. 
What struck me about those clips is he was always returning to first principles, yes. always returning to the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution and our form of government and the success of our form of government to judge current policies. Paul Ryan does that. None of the other people who appear on the stage in these debates really does that and does it in a credible way. So my fear is we will um, nominate someone who will probably defeat Barack Obama, and then the Republicans will run to their post return to their post-1932 pattern. The Democrats vote gigantic new programs, and the Republicans come in and clean things up and make sure the taxes get raised to support right. those programs. Right. The role of Eisenhower, the role of Nixon, uh, the role of uh, the first Bush, the role of the second Bush with his prescri prescription drug program and no child left behind. Uh, the Republicans are sort of the sober managers of the administrative state uh, and the Democrats are the crazy managers of the administrative state. And I believe that this is equivalent to moving the deck chairs around upon the Titanic. Paul, last, last question before we take a moment to to entertain questions from our audience. Last question. You said the question, early in the program, you said the question is whether this country will remain a country of liberties a century from now. Now, you and I are in good health, but we won't see the, we will, neither of us will see the moment. These students of yours will come closer to doing so. Yes. So here we have been talking about things which, let's face it, are a little depressing. You've gone from saying two years ago, Barack Obama is a gift to the Friends of Liberty, to saying, gee, I look at the current Republican field and it's not impressive. Friends of Liberty aren't up to the job. The Friends of Liberty aren't up to the job. Exactly. The Friends of Liberty are like Paul Ryan staying home and rooting for the Green Bay Packers. Um, so what, what two lines of advice would you offer to an 18 or 19 year old Hillsdale student who's looking at, say, Paul Ray, one of my most esteemed professors, is saying fundamentally the country in which I am about to embark, bright and cheerful and with the benefit of a Hillsdale education, about which I am about to embark on my life and career, is going to hell. My advice to them would be to go into public life, to take what they've learned at Hillsdale and articulate it in the public arena. It could be that we will miss 2012 as an opportunity, but as Holman Jenkins pointed out, the old progressive era is coming to an end. The administrative entitlement state eats its seed corn, and you can see this with Social Security. We aren't having enough children to support people in the manner in which suppose, Social Security is supposed to support people. The crisis if it is not faced up to in 2012, it will be faced later. The crisis is upon us. The crisis is upon us other. and it's not gonna go away. You might be able to move things around and put it off for a few years, but then it'll creep back upon us. If there is not fundamental reform, bankruptcy will threaten us time and again. Uh, and there's no escaping uh, from reality. You know, Margaret Thatcher said, sooner or later you run out of other people's money. Mm -hmm. um, we're in a worse situation. Sooner or later you run out of other people's children mm. Mm. Um, because there aren't going to be enough people working to support this structure for people who are retired. And it is a brute fact. Now, Paul Ryan will still be around. Paul Ryan's only 41. Right. Uh, so if we fail in 2012, there may be another opportunity. Now, I doubt we will ever see another Democrat who puts things in as stark a terms as Barack Obama. Think about it. We are in the middle of a terrible economic downturn, the worst since the Great Depression. Barack Obama has himself said the worst thing you could possibly do is raise taxes in such circumstances, and now he is proposing Half to raise billion? taxes right, right. in such circumstances. Right. Paul Ray, holder of the chair in the Western Heritage at Hillsdale College and the author of a number of books, including 
Republic's Ancient and Modern. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us.